three, two, one, zero. All engine running. There is no other institution that has the ability uniquely, without a heritage, every generation starts over. To remind the current regime, what your country, we the people, tell the government what it is allowed to do. Back in their box and stay there. Lift off. From the Heritage Foundation, this is Heritage Explains. Percy Spencer was the epitome of a self taught man. He was born in rural Maine in 1894, where, after a series of tragic family losses, he began working to support the family in a spool mill from sunup to sundown at the age of 12. By the time he was 16, he learned that another local mill was taking on the use of electricity, which was rare in that region for that time. He did all he could to learn about this new technology. He joined the U.S. Navy at 18 years old and read every textbook he could get his hands on, on math, science, and technology. And his particular passion was for radio science. By the time of the Second World War, Spencer was one of the world's foremost experts in emerging radar technology. As a scientist for Raytheon, he worked with the technologies that one day helped win the Second World War for the Allies. During the research process for a new device known as a magnetron, Spencer was standing nearby when he realized that the chocolate bar in his pocket had melted. After the war, he was able to refine the technology, and Raytheon produced the very first microwave oven. As amazing as that story is, it isn't that uncommon. Inventions produced out of necessity in wartime often become staples in peace. This includes things like superglue, which was produced to create gun sites, duct tape, which was produced for ammunition cases, and widespread use of penicillin and blood plasma, which had to be produced in mass quantities for soldiers. Such paradigm shifts, peace to war, chaos to order, and back again, are defining moments in history. We live through some of our own, in ways big and small. One thinks of the 9-11 terrorist attack, the COVID-19 pandemic. These changes leave their mark on the world. In the story of the United States border, elections are one such defining moment. Paradigms shift, alignments change, and suddenly it's a whole new ballgame. And the 2020 election in which Joe Biden defeated incumbent Donald Trump was a defining moment. Today on Heritage Explains, we are talking to somebody who had a front row seat to that moment. Mark Morgan uh, was the former acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection under President Trump. And I think what's important to mention, too, I was also the chief of the Border Patrol under President Obama. I've served uh, as an FBI agent for two decades as a Marine. I was a police officer for LAPD. I've served this country for over 40 years under six administrations, both Republican and Democrat administrations. How did you wind up in law enforcement? I first went into the Marine Corps. My father served in the Army. My uncle served in the Marine Corps. I just had that public service instilled in me as a young man, so I went into the Marine Corps. And then I think it was a natural transition from serving the Marines to serving the communities and country and law enforcement. And you initially started out at LAPD? Yeah, I did. So I graduated law school uh, and then went to LAPD. And then from LAPD, I went to the FBI. What were you doing for the LAPD? Yeah, so I worked uh, then. They had 18 geographical divisions. And I worked one of the, it's called the 77th. It was in the south end, LAPD. And I did that for about a year and a half. I was just a beat cop in that district before the FBI picked me up. Right out of law school. Right out of law school. So you were so a I did beat it kind cop, of backwards. Yeah, beat cop with a law degree. Exactly. Very unusual. I did it backwards, <laughs> like most of my life. Did it affect your policing at all? Did it, it give you a different perspective? I, I think it did. I, I think it's a great question. I had a better understanding of just basic concepts concepts, whether it's a Terry stop, reasonable suspicion, what probable cause meant. These were all new concepts to kids in the academy for the first time. These are things that I'd been looking at and discussed for the past three years. How did you wind up going from being a beat cop to winding up on border security. Yeah, that was an unusual path. Part of my path as the FBI agent, I ended up as the special agent in charge of the FBI's El Paso division. And I always just say that from my war, my office in El Paso, I could actually see Juarez. And that was the first time, I feel bad admitting this actually, it was the first time after then it'd been about 17, 18 years, that I really became to understand CBP. 
It was really the first time I worked with them extensively. And, and we did because they were actually big dogs, both OFO at the port and Border Patrol. And that's the first time that I really got to understand what CBP was, what oh, what Border Patrol was. And I got to tell you, I was amazed. The Border Patrol especially, OFO too, but I think we worked a lot with Border Patrol. And I saw they remind me of being a Marine. They, they gained my respect, my admiration, and I really understood the importance of their mission and the importance of border security. I really got to see that as the FBI SAC. And then fast forward a couple of years later, the chief of Border Patrol position happened to open up. And I got a call from the then acting, no, I think he was the deputy commissioner at the time and commissioner. And they said, hey, Mark, would you be interested? And I hadn't thought about it till that moment. And but then I, I went back and hung up and I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. And so I put in for chief. And next thing you know, I was hired. And then the rest is history. And that was under the Obama administration? Yeah, that was under the Obama administration. Yeah. But I think I, – and I really appreciate you asking that because I get stuck simply because I was commissioner for President Trump. And obviously I support his policies when it comes to the border security. People think, oh, he's just a mega guy. He's just a Trump guy. And I'm like, no. I've been a career official my entire life. Like I said, I was a border patrol chief under Obama, served six administrations, both Republican and Democrat. This isn't about politics for me. This is about America. Yeah. So a lot of people probably don't have a whole lot of context for CBP. If you wanted to get to know the Border Patrol, what yeah. would that look like? Yeah, that's a great question, too. I wish I had a dollar for every time they said former acting commissioner of Customs and Border Patrol instead of Border Protection. I think when people think of the Southwest Border, they only think of the big green machine, Border Patrol. But Border Patrol is actually a part of CBP, Customs and Border Protection, which includes... Border Patrol, but also other areas. OFO, Office of Field Operations, which owns all our ports of entry, land, sea, and airports. As well, we have an Air and Marine Division that's as part of CBP and a significant director that kind of oversees our lawful trade and travel. A lot of people don't understand CBP is the second largest revenue collector for the United States, second to the IRS. CBP has 63,000 employees. It's the largest federal law enforcement agency in the United States with a 13 to $15 billion annual budget. It's a beast with a huge mission set from tra- counterterrorism, transnational criminal organizations, border security, obviously, and facilitating lawful trade and travel. It's a beast. And where does it fall in the context of the federal government? Is it Homeland Security, Justice? Where yeah, does it live? DHS. So it is one of the major components within the Department of Homeland Security. Got it. So obviously you saw some changes happen in the border situation between Obama and Trump. And we've talked to Tom Homan a lot about the development of border security over time. He's also been in the government for a long time. Yep. On this transition between Obama and Trump, uh, what was that transition like from your perspective? First of all, Tom is probably Tom Holman, great guy, another patriot. He's probably the best one to really talk about that transition. So I'm glad you had him on. Here's what I would summarize: is President Trump what we saw for the first time, in my opinion, is a president that understood this very important line: is that border security is synonymous with national security. President Trump got it. He got that what was happening on the southwest border wasn't about immigration. It was about protecting the sovereignty of our nation, enforcing the rule of law, and ensuring that our nation's safety and national security is protected. So when you look at the border like that, which is the right way, it drives the right policies. And he also understood that it's not about resources. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people, oh, the former commissioner and chief saying he doesn't need resources. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that that's not the sole solution, just throwing more resources at it. Let's throw more agents at it and more technology and more money and we'll call it a day. No, you have to have policies. You can throw all the resources at it. If you don't have the right policies, as we're seeing right now, you're going to have a disastrous wide open border. President Trump got it. And he, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. There, there's so many out there. But the Migrant Protection Protocol, or media coined it, the Remain in Mexico program. He, again, perfect quintessential example of how the president got it and all his advisors got it. There was a time, even under President Trump, because of the current law and because of some bad lower court judicial decisions, specifically the floor settlement agreement, is that we had instituted and developed something called catch and release. Meaning if you were an unaccompanied minor or you were a family that came to our border illegally, and if you came as a family, you were processed and released in the United States. We could not detain you or remove you while you went through the immigration proceedings. 
That was stupid. It was dumb. Common sense tells you that if as soon as people f- f- figure that out from all over the world, that's why we saw the crisis in 2019 of families coming in. We said, hey, we got to change that. So we did. So what did we do? We closed that loophole by the Remain in Mexico program, which said, if you come to our border illegally, we're not going to release you in the United States. We're going to remove you back to Mexico while you're still able to apply for asylum. We didn't stop anybody from applying asylum. That's a big lie and a big myth. Is that? But while you're going through the asylum, you're going to wait in Mexico. We're not going to release you in the United States. And so what was the result of that? They stopped coming because they knew the overwhelming majority of migrants coming to our border are economic migrants. They do not qualify for asylum. They are not the victims of state-sponsored persecution because of their involvement in a particular class. So we saw the numbers by February of 2020 reduced by 85 percent. And we had the most secure border in our lifetime. So then eventually... Biden is elected. The next administration comes in. At that point, you're still in office when that happens? Correct. So what does that transition look like for you personally? Yeah, so that's very important. A lot of people don't ask about that, the transition. And it's very important because there's so many issues that's been lost in the shuffle. Here's what I'll say. So I was still acting commissioner. So any administration, whenever it changes, right, from whether it's within the same party or different parties, is that there is a transition team that is developed by the incoming White House. Then the current individuals, which would have been us, we provide them a series of briefings. When it came to border security, when it came to DHS, remember, a good question you had, so CBP falls within DHS. So DHS provided the Biden transition team over 200 briefings. The overwhelming majority of those briefings were on border security. Mark, we went through Biden's transition team methodically, step by step. We went through each policy. We went through the resources. We went through the multi-layer strategy of why at the border you need infrastructure, technology, personnel, and the right policies. We walked them through why we developed certain policies, which loophole it created, closed, and how effective it was, and how it reduced illegal immigration, again, like I said, by 85 percent, how we got more agents back on the line to protect our national security. And we also told them and walk through methodically, if you do, and if you enact the policies that you say you're going to during the campaign, and if you're going to dismantle what you say you're going to dismantle, you will create a self-inflicted, unmitigated border security crisis that will pale in comparison to anything we've seen. They ignored us, they dismissed us, and they did exactly what they said they were going to do the campaign anyway. And what do we have right now? The worst unmitigated border security crisis in our lifetime. I guess a lot of people wouldn't really understand how a presidential transition like that works. The president has already appointed somebody new to come in and fill those positions, and then there's a certain amount of time before which you're going to be out and that new person is going to be in. Is that correct. correct? That's correct. And that's why you have this transition team because, like, they hadn't appointed – like, they hadn't appointed a secretary of DHS yet. They hadn't appointed an ICE director yet or CBP commissioner yet. Those come as, as it continues to transition. That's why that transition team is so important because they're getting all the information. So when these individuals are identified to come in, they're like, here's the playbook. Here's what's going on. And so do you think that all those folks who came in, were they true believers? Were they interested at all in what you had to say? Or do you think they were just there because they had to be? Another great question. I believe, at least the feedback that I got, the transition team, they were listening. In fact, we felt good because the feedback I was getting is, hey, the transition folks, the Biden transition folks are saying, hey, yeah, we got it. We understand, right? But then it all broke down, right? Because then it's the ideologues and the political appointees that Biden brought in that actually were going to enact policy and implement that policy. That was not the transition team. So then what happens? Does everything kind of change at once? Immediately, fast hard immediately. From the moment that Biden took over, he started canceling and dismantling almost every single effective tool authority and policy we had in place. To date, I think he's enacted over 300 executive orders impacting border security. So we don't have enough time to talk about all of them. But let me talk about a couple. So I I mentioned the Remain in Mexico program, single-handedly the most effective policy that closed the largest loophole catch and release that really single-handedly reduced illegal immigration dramatically and allowed us to more effectively secure our borders. Day one, gone dismantled that. The ACAs, the Asylum Cooperative Agreements, the, for lack of a better term, the Safe Third Country Agreements that we had with all three Northern Triangle countries, which meant this. 
if you're an alien who is has a legitimate claim that you're fleeing state-sponsored persecution because of your involvement in a protected class, the international standard, our standard, our want, our needs should be to get that alien, to get that migrant relief in the first safe third country they could. It makes sense. Why would they continue the journey to continue to put their lives in the hands of the cartels, their financial well-being, their physical well-being, and be treated like cattle, treated like a commodity? That's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Get relief in the first safe third country. That's what the ACAs were, and they were effective. And day one, Biden, gone. So MPP, gone. ACA is gone. And then let's talk the infrastructure, the wall. The bane of every liberal's existence, right? And it's not based on reality. It's just based on pure ideology, which makes them ignorant of the truth. If you ask any Border Patrol agent on the line that's risking his or her life every single day for our country, for our safety, they're going to tell you walls work and they are needed and they're effective as part of the multi-layer strategy of infrastructure, technology, and personnel. No Border Patrol agent, Mark, is going to tell you that the walls are the end all to be all the only solution. They'll say they are an effective part of that multi-layer strategy. And what did Biden do? Boom, ended it. And here's the wall. The wall was much more than just steel and concrete going in the ground. The wall had part of that wall system was access roads, was integrated lighting, was state-of-the-art technology to help border patrol agents detect threats before they actually get to our borders. And the list goes on and on. So when he stopped building the wall, he stopped building access roads, he stopped building lighting, he stopped building the technology that went with it. So as you and that started immediately on day one of his administration, even Title 42. So for those who, you know, remember Title 42, that was a public health order that was designed to prevent the further introduction of an infectious disease into the country. We instituted that in March of 2020. I believe that saved untold numbers of American lives and migrants as well. And the Biden administration on day one did a carve out for unaccompanied minors. Said if you're an unaccompanied minor, nope, you get in. You get in. We were still in the throes of the pandemic. Last time I checked, a 15, 17 year old could carry COVID just like an adult. Said, so don't care. Didn't make sense. Then he started expanding that to families. So if you're coming across as an unaccompanied minor, Title 40 didn't, didn't apply. If you're coming across as a family, Title 42 didn't apply. Look, so from day one, Mark, he started this systematic dismantling of every effective tool authority we had in place, and he continues to do that today. And I go a step further today. Not as he had dismantled dismantled what we had in place, but now he's actually violating the law and making up new law in their quest for open borders. In previous interviews, we've talked about how the Biden administration has kept the course on what they want to do in terms of the border. The thing that only thing that seems to prevent them or slow them down is optics. Things look bad. And lawsuits. So what has been your experience of that? Have you seen any changes in the direction of the Biden administration? What seems to be their MO going forward? Zero. They're a a foot pedal to the metal. They're unabashful. They're unapologetic. And they've doubled down at any avenue they have. And even when there's lawsuits, there's been multiple states. Texas is probably leading the way with the most lawsuits. But Florida's adjoined. And and there are times there's 17, 18 states that have joined in different lawsuits. That has slowed them down at times. But not like it should, because this administration, they just don't care. Even when a court says you cannot do, you can, you need to stop the policy X, Y, Z, they ignore it. When I was commissioner, and we had the same thing, right? We were in a day with lawsuits. But I can tell you, when a lawsuit came down, I'd be frustrated. I'd be mad. I would say, this is wrong. This isn't based on the merits. And I'd say, implement it, though, because it's the law. The courts have spoken. We have to comply with the law, even if we don't like it. We didn't try to circumvent it. We didn't try to skirt around it. We said it is what it is. And so until we can get an injunction and it gets dismissed in our favor, then it is what it is. Not this administration. Secretary Mayorkas, Mark, he's the first secretary in our lifetime that has assumed that role, very significant role as a cabinet level official, secretary of DHS, that looks at the law And the courts as a mere advisory opinion, not something that he must follow or shall follow. That's why I get so frustrated with him. That's why I've been calling for his impeachment, that and many reasons, really, probably since the first month he took office. Can you talk a little bit more about Secretary Mayorkas? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, just the mention of his name, I get this visceral response. Right? Have you ever met him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because remember, so when, and that's why I like the setup you did. So when I was chief of the Border Patrol, Myricus was deputy secretary of DHS. 
So he's like my boss I reported to. Very different man than what I saw then. Really? Real, absolutely. Look, I saw him as a number two. He was in the shadows. He uh, supported then Secretary Jay Johnson. You very heard very little from Deputy Secretary Mayorkas then, very little at all. Didn't really hear much about his ideology or his policies. Obviously, things have changed dramatically. This is a guy, like I said, that has come in that views the law as an advisory opinion. This is a secretary that has directed the men and women under his charge to actually violate the laws that statutorily they're supposed to enforce. This is a man who has abdicated his oath. He's abused of his authority. He's lied to Congress. He's lied to the American people. That could go on. This is, look, there is no doubt in my mind that this man should be impeached. Not only has he been overseen and been the chief architect of the worst border security disaster in our lifetime, but he's just lying about it. He's just absolutely. I'll give you a couple examples. How many more times do we need to hear the secretary say during a congressional hearing under oath, quote, the border is secure. We have operational control. The greatest one was when Representative Chip Roy, during a congressional hearing, he blew up the 2000 Secure Fence Act definition. And this is very important. The 2000 Secure, 2006 Secure Fence Act says in part that the Secretary of DHS shall, not if he feels like it, not if he agrees, shall, must, will ensure that the prevention of all illegal aliens, contraband, terrorists, and weapons of terrorism from crossing our borders. Boom. Now, a lot of people, even myself, will say, that's a pretty tough standard. But guess what? It is aspirational. It was designed to be aspirational after 9-11 because we didn't want a terrorist attack, right? We don't want drugs coming in. We don't want criminals coming in. We should secure our borders. So it's aspirational, yes, but that should be our goal to prevent every single illegal alien, every ounce of drug, every potential terrorist from entering our border. This secretary comes in. Not only is he just both ice lie and says, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got operational control. Let me give you one stat that just blows that out. Now, in the first 27 months, and I was just doing the data this week, the first 27 months under his tutelage, there have been over 1.5 million known gotaways. A chief of the Border Patrol in a congressional testimony said that's easily underreported by 20, 20%. So I don't like to do public math, but let's say that's in the realm of 1.7 million total gotaways. Illegal aliens who have come to our border and evaded apprehension and now in the United States. 1.7 million. And this secretary says we have operational control of our southwest border. It's a lunacy. It's idiotic. It's a lie. He knows it's a lie. And he keeps telling the American people that. And so based on that ground alone, I think he should be impeached. But now look at what he's doing now when it comes to, for example, parole. And this is very important. So parole is supposed to be used on a case by case, individual basis for a significant public benefit or humanitarian reason. So let's say you're an immigrant and you have a life altering medical condition and that your country doesn't have the medical capability to give you the surgery, but the U.S. says, no problem, we'll parole you and we'll get that surgery, right? Or let's say you're going to be a witness in a long-term, very high-level, sophisticated investigation going after some cartel members in the United States. We're going to parole you in to be that witness. Good to go. That's not what's happening. They just say, no, you know what? We're going to redefine the law. I know that's the law, but I don't care about the law, right? It doesn't matter to me. Only my ideology cares. So what I'm going to do as a secretary, if you're from Nicaragua, Cuba, Haiti, or Venezuela, just being born in those four countries, you get to be paroled in. Mass parole, direct violation of the law. And now with the CBP-1 app, it's not just a violation of the law. It's a perversion of the law, what he's doing. It's a big shell game. He's just transferring illegal aliens from in between the ports to the ports of entry, and he's calling it a legal pathway. Obviously, things are not going well at the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Do you have any insight to the boots on the ground, the people who are doing the work, the people who are working for Customs and Border Protection and for Border Patrol? How are they responding to this yeah. leadership? They're pissed off. They're angry. I would say, I would even go and say, they're hurt. And here's why I say this is very important. Think about this. So you sacrificed a lot. Your family has sacrificed a lot. You went through a lot of training. And every single day you wake up, I've been there, you put that badge on your chest, you holster that weapon, and you go to the front lines of our nation's borders to, to be willing any day to risk your life, literally lay down your life in defense of our nation's safety and national security. 
And all you ask is administration give you the tools and authorities to do just that. And what they saw, and this isn't a this isn't a political thing. I call look, I'm gonna occur guy, I call balls and strikes, but the reality is President Trump gave us a network of tools and authorities and policies we needed to have the most secure border in our lifetime. That's not BS, that's not political, that's not being some mega extremist sycophant Donald Trump. That is reality. And guess who knew that? The Border Patrol. They were on the front lines. They felt it. They saw it. They see this wall being built. They see lighting going in and access roads and technology. And they see the same thing at the ports of entry. And they see policies that actually allows Border Patrol to do their job, to close loopholes, to stop illegal immigration, to get more agents on the line, to stop smugglers, stop drugs and criminals from coming in. They saw that. They d- During a time period under, uh, under Donald J. Trump, they... They were revived again. They saw why they signed up to do what they were doing, and they're able to do what they're doing. And what they have seen in the past 27 months is all of that has been taken away every single day. There are, in some areas, Mark, there are 80 to 90 percent of Border Patrol resources that are not on the front line. They're back in facilities processing the illegal aliens and releasing the United States. So guess what? When they hear about a fentanyl death in Missouri or Vermont or Montana, Border Patrol agents, they hurt. Because they know that that fentanyl came across the southwest border. And they know that the fentanyl is coming across at epidemic levels because they're not on the border. They're not there to catch it. They know there are criminals. The 1.7 million total gotaways, the Border Patrol agents, they're demoralized. It kills them because they know among the 1.7 million gotaways, they're not all good people. Now, I did not say they're all bad people, but they're not all good. In 27 months, Border Patrol have encountered 80,000 criminals, including murderers, rapists, pedophiles, aggravated felons, and gang members. 134 convicted murderers they've apprehended, over 1,500 gang members, including majority of them MS-13, and thousands of those that were convicted or charged with aggravated assault. That's who they've apprehended. Think about the number of murders, rapists, pedophiles, aggravated felons, and gang members among the 1.7 million. Guess who know that better than anybody? The border trade agents on the front line. They're on a desk right now in a facility miles from the border processing the illegal alien to release them to the United States and never be heard it from again. They're angry. They're mad. They have no respect for their leadership, let alone the secretary of DHS, Secretary Mayorkas. Okay, so, Mark, a lot of people, when we talk about especially crime and the people coming across the border, the number of gotaways, they talk about this idea that we're fear mongering. Yeah. We're spreading fear about a potential terrorist attack, a potential criminal act potential rapes, murders, all those sorts of things. What's your response to that? Is that fear mongering? No. And this is, Mark, this is such a great question because here's the narrative, right? The narrative is what's happening at the border is about that poor, vulnerable migrant, about the mother with two kids in tow just looking for a better life. Besides, that's not a valid asylum claim. That's doesn't tell the whole story. And so when you do talk about criminals come across immediately, right, you're called a racist, you're hyperbolic, you're fear mongering because, gosh, Mark, everybody coming across is good. It's a lie. It's not true. And I could give you so many stats. Let me give you one. And unfortunately, we only have a couple of states because most states do not track crimes committed by illegal aliens in the United States. But one state does. Why don't they? I, uh, well, there's two reasons. I think one, Democrats, because it doesn't fit into their narrative, right, that everybody coming across is are good people. And two, I think some Republican states, I think they're just out of touch. I just don't think they get it and understand the importance. And I think that this really does a disservice to the American people because they don't have a full understanding. So one state from 2011 to 2022. 261,000 criminal illegal aliens committed 433,000 crimes, including 800 homicides, 800 kidnappings, and 5,000 sexual assaults. That's one state, you said. One state, state of Texas. One state. If that doesn't wake you up, right? And again, I'll go back to the other stat. In the last 27 months, Border Patrol and OFO have encountered 80,000 criminals. That's who they've apprehended, 80,000, including, and look, anybody listening, this isn't Mark. Go to CBP stats. Just grab your iPhone, type in CBP stats, and it'll pull it up, and it'll say, it'll talk about a criminal arrest. And it's right there in black and white, 80,000 the past 27 months, including 134 aliens that were convicted murderers. Almost 1,500 gang members, the majority of MS-13. The list goes on and on, aggravated felons. That's who they've apprehended. 
Now, let's go back to the 1.7 million total gotaways. Mark, you don't have to be a border security expert. They're gotaways for a reason because the overwhelming majority of the millions that have come across, when they come across, they, they literally sit down. They sit down and wait for Border Patrol because they know they're going to be processed and released. So why do you have a gotaway? If you're going to be processed or released, because that's where the that's where the criminals are, that's where the drug traffickers are, that's where the murderers, the rapists, the, the aggravated felons and gang members, they're among the gotaways. My question to anybody is, how many are you okay with? How many murderers, how many rapists, how many MS-13 gang members are you okay evading apprehension every single day? How many more, you know, mothers, angel families do we have to hear? How many more young 22-year-olds do we have to read about that was savagely beaten and raped and strangled to death by an illegal alien? We hear about them almost every single week. How many more before we say enough is enough, we have to secure the border? And what we're being told is a big lie. Yeah. So let's say that a new administration somehow came in tomorrow and they called you up. Yeah. What would you tell them to do? Here's a a couple of signal things. We could talk next hours about the details of what they need to do. But on the physical border, the first thing they need to do is close the significant loopholes and catch and release. How do you end catch and release? Reinstate the Remain in Mexico program. So anybody that comes to our border, whether they come in at a port of entry or in between a port of entry, because it's not just about those that are illegally entering. It's about those that are coming and illegally entering and or filing false claims. So even if you come up to a port of entry, which is why CBP-1 app is a perversion of the law, is they're still filing false claims. So whether you come to a port of entry or in between, you have to reinstate the Remain in Mexico program, make them wait in Mexico while they're going through their asylum process. That'll end catch and release. You'll see the numbers go down drastically. Number two, reinstate the safe third country agreements, which provides a bar. If you transit through a safe third country and you come to the United States, there are no exceptions. There are no excuses. You're banned from claiming asylum, period. You have to claim and the first safe third country you come to. The next thing I do is I would start building the wall. The wall, again, is part of that multi-layer strategy, infrastructure, technology, and personnel. And then another issue on the policy side is credible fear. Credible fear is the first hurdle that an alien has to overcome. Basically, though, they just have to say the magic words. And there, you can actually go online and just type in credible fear, and it'll give you sentences, the magic words that you have to say. And if you say the magic words, then you're accepted into the uh, asylum process. We need to actually beef up that and adjust that standard so they really actually have have to prove that they are victims of state-sponsored persecution because of involvement of protected class. Those are some policies that will affect the border and the flow and our ability to secure our border. But then on the interior, look, we've got to let ICE do their job. We've got to make sure that ICE is actually going after people that are here illegally and deporting them. We have to bump up the 287G program which th- that allows local law enforcement to actually work with ICE for illegal aliens that have been picked up have to commit another crime and make sure that they're a priority to remove them. That's not happening right now. Yeah. So the CBP-1 app. Here's Look, it, it's a joke. It's a perversion of the law. First of all, there's a couple of lies out there. One is do a lot of talking about the transit rule that they've developed and that what they're saying is if you're an illegal alien that come to the U.S. and if you transit through a safe third country and you didn't apply for asylum there, you're barred for five years from claiming asylum. So Democrats are mad. Republicans say, hey, this sounds great. This looks like a Trump policy. They're both wrong because it's all BS. Here's the reality is in that rule, the exception to the rule has overtaken the rule itself, meaning you could transit through 100 safe third countries, not apply for asylum. And if you get the U.S.-Mexico border, as long as you get on the CBP-1 app and apply through the CBP-1 app, guess what? You come to port of entry process, you're released in the United States. It's a joke. It's a shell game. The other thing that's happening is people aren't paying attention. They're only paying attention to the encounters in between the ports of entry. But what this administration is doing is, through the unlawful use of parole on the CBP-1 app, it's a shell game. They're just convincing migrants to stop illegally entering in between the ports of entry and just come to the ports of entry, where we're continuing to look the other way as they file false claims, their process, and release the United States. I really implore everybody, look at total encounters. Don't just look at what's happening in between the ports of entry. Look at the ports of entry. From 2020 to now, the inadmissibles that are coming to the ports of entry and releasing the United States have increased by 304%. But we're not paying attention to that, and we should. Here on Heritage Explains, we believe not only in problems, but in solutions. 
We believe that with the right legislation, we can end the tide of human suffering and restore America's integrity. In other words, the same country that can invent a microwave on accident can invent peace on the border. Next week, we're talking to somebody who shares that belief, Congressman Chip Roy of the great state of Texas, about what has been happening on Capitol Hill over the last few weeks. And the news is good. So make sure you don't miss it. Thank you to Mark Morgan and Laura Rees for their contributions to this episode. And thank you to you for listening to Heritage Explains. If you have any thoughts about our show, we'd love to hear them. Just send us a message at heritageexplains at heritage.org. We'll see you next week. Heritage Explains is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It's written and produced by Mark Guiney, Lauren Evans, and John Pop. Production assistance by Alexa Walker and Jeff Smith.